Welcome back everyone, theCUBE's live coverage, day two here. I'm here, I'm John Furrier, here with Rob Strecce. We're analyzing all the data, asking all the right questions it's about open source changing the game with AI, security, cloud native technology. The Linux Foundation's annual, this was a premier conference where the brightest minds get together. It's not a huge event in terms of like a KubeCon or cloud native, but it's the right amount of people. It's the biggest names in open source, charting the future, setting the agenda. Chris Jones is here, Business Development Manager, Platform 9. Chris, great to see you again. Uh, we had a chat in our studios in Palo Alto a few months ago, great to see you. Yeah, thank you. Great to be back. Platform 9 has been doing a lot of work on providing managed services for clients deploying Kubernetes. We've had many conversations about that. But that's just an example of what is being done. A lot of platformization is happening, or platform engineering is happening, big topic. AI and ML, again, is like provisioning large infrastructure. It is, it is. What do you guys see right now? What's the big focus? Take a minute to explain what your focus is right now at Platform 9. So, this year, primarily three areas we're focusing on, right? It's data center modernization, application modernization. Let's use what you've got today and do more with it, right? Maybe moving on to something like KubeVirt to get onto right. a newer virtualization stack that's converged with Kubernetes. That's one area that we're focusing heavily on. Another is retail edge and leveraging orchestration capabilities to do bare metal management um, in, in any location, but particularly in the retail area where you know, modernizing that in-store experience means transforming the, the, the compute layer that's there. So let's make that cloud native, make it simple, reduce the truck roll costs. The third area is AI and ML. And that's an area that I've been spending a lot of time working with, it's an area that we saw users coming to us back in, in 2020, saying, hey, this seems like the next thing for doing you know, orchestration of compute, batch computing, running training jobs, as well as, as serving inferencing. And this conference has really shown that like, Kubernetes will become that, that default foundational layer for running training and for, for, serving, for serving models. What's exciting about the AI ML piece Obviously, we've been talking about the impact of open source. Mainstream enterprises are adopting it. People are kicking the tires. What are you seeing? I think the, it's choice and variety that is happening in the, the AI ML space right now, especially in the open source world. You know, you've got Kubeflow, Airflow, you've got things like Flight that came out of Lyft. There's, there's options there, and you know, sitting through the, the last session I was asked in that was presented by IKEA, they've got a slide that they pulled up that showed their entire ML stack. And this is what they're running in public cloud, this is what they're running in data centers, and it was all 100% open source. They've got a team that's operationalizing that, right? The foundation is obviously Kubernetes, there's yeah. things like Argo CD in there and Knative, and on top of that, there was MLflow and a few other tools that you know, personally were new to me, but they were looking at um, model drift platforms and everything, all, all open source. And that, I mean, that's incredibly I, exciting. I think what, I want to kind of catch on to something you said there because him and I had a little disagreement when we were wrapping up yesterday <laughs> around, uh, and I think the word repatriation from cloud gets thrown around, and I think it's more right-sizing right-sizing yep. the stack. And it, you know, coming from a, a data background and some open source, uh, looking at it, ML AI is just, it's about data. And it's about massive amounts of data. And a lot of times going up to the cloud can be super expensive for doing yep. that. What, what are you seeing? I mean, you just talked about IKEA is doing it both places, which make, to me makes total sense. But what are you guys seeing? We're seeing a, an availability problem. I need a GPU, where do I do that? Right. Oh, I'll go to the public cloud, this, it's, it's going to be there, it's not. So businesses are being impeded by the availability of resources. Mm. Now, you could say repatriation, I think a lot of modern companies might be saying, can I do this elsewhere? Like, is cloud my only option? Cloud isn't, but then they, they get, oh my God, I need to go back into server mode. Right. Do I have the skills to do this? How do I even then, you know, avoid using a spreadsheet to let my data science team run workloads. So that's where that ML ops thing is coming in. But I think a lot of organizations might be fearful that there's a lot they need to do, right? IKEA's done basically an MVP 
and they, they're like, now we have to start scaling this. They've done a lot of that hard work. So it is achievable. And the thing that, that I've been wondering is, should, it, should you do it in the data center, what's the ROI there? Right. Right, ask IKEA, they're going to say it's fairly high. Right, you, you can go to Dell, HP, Supermicro, you can get a server with a bunch of GPUs in it, you can put that in a data center and you can do it today. Yeah. And I, that's, what we're, that's what we're beginning to see. And I think, I think one of the things is that people are getting subscription fatigue to a certain extent as well. And they're looking at it, especially in the kind of economy that we have right at the moment where uh, you know, having something that you can write down that's CapEx oriented seems, is that also some of the stuff that you're seeing? It's more, some of it's coming from the CFO and saying, and the CIO saying, hey, you know, we have the skills, maybe we're a little rusty at them, but that, we have the skills. That's a hundred percent. 37 Signals, the, the base camp, and hey guys, yes. yeah, they've yeah. been pretty vocal recently, so to saying, hey, we've- That's completely very bullshit. Vocal. I'm tell I, I call <laughs> bullshit on that, I got to say. First of all, I had a whole repatriation rant. So, so first of all, I, I love that guy, by the way, he's awesome. Yeah. However, he's a little dogmatic on this one. So, my message is this. Repatriation is not, the people who are framing repatriation are trying to make it like clouds fail, yeah. okay? Because they want to they want to be, oh no, no, it's all the data center. It's, they're not repatriating, they're refactoring for cloud operations. Yeah. Yeah. That means they're moving stuff over to set the footprint for distributed computing. In some cases, it makes sense for a company not to have anything in the cloud if they can do it on site better. Yeah. That's yeah. not a repatriate, that's not a trend, it's not a thing. Now that's, that's a business decision, but that's not actually happening if you look at the numbers. Yeah. Dave Vellante's got the numbers, Charles Fitzgerald's got the numbers, Fitzy. Yeah. It's complete BS, so that whole, and by the way, the data centers are getting out of the managed service business because they want to get bought by Amazon and Google and Azure. So if we're going to pick the scabs of the yeah, data but center, but I, I think like, you, you, you know, you're actually saying the same thing that we're saying, which is that it's the right place for the right workload at the right time. And I think what we've been talking is the, the complexity that goes into platform engineering and having a common stack yeah. across those That's is different. really the key. I mean, there are people out there that are hardcore, they call them the repatriates. Yeah, yeah. They're the, the repatriates, <laughs> yeah. that's what, what Fitzy calls them. Yeah. They're just, they just want to see, they're, they're like the mainframe huggers. Yeah. Like they want their old way back and it's never going to happen. Cloud has yeah. won, cloud operations is going to win. And I think that's the edge is next. So that's what we're here, that's what open source is driving to. So I don't see that as repatriating. Refactoring is a different story. Yeah, a right point. sizing, refactoring, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, cost optimization is natural. You, and you need to do it with the right tooling. Yeah. You, you, I mean, 37 Signals has created Maersk. I think that's how you say it. Yes. It's, what is it, like Mesos or Docker Swarm 2.0? It's yeah. like simpler, yeah. it works really well for their particular way of Doing running things. their containerized yes. applications. Yeah. I personally would probably say, I think Kubernetes is the right approach. Just have a conversation if you don't want to run it with a vendor. You know, They very publicly said, well, we went and talked to Rancher and it didn't go very well. Well, yeah. maybe you were talking to someone that was selling in a very old fashioned manner. Yeah. Right? Have an upfront, honest conversation with a vendor and be like, okay, we can run cloud ourselves in a more cost efficient way and find a data center provider that can provide everything for you, right? Actually, I want to bring this up because we were talking about, you were talking before we came on camera about you, what you guys are doing with, at Platform 9 with AI and ML. We had one person in the queue came up and we were talking about one approach is to keep everything on premise in a data center for the LLM because you can actually over provision and leverage the hardware better until you get a handle on it. That's one, that was, I forget yeah. who that was, but yeah. it, um, I can't remember I either, mean, but. It was just one approach. That's plausible, I can see that. Um, Amazon's saying, hey, no, no, we can use us to say, <laughs> say, <laughs> I, I think. What do you think about that? What's your reaction to that? Because it's not yet known, but I can, if you have the hardware. If you have the hardware and the data's on prem, then buy some GPUs and do it on premise. Like, they, you're going to get an ROI versus renting those GPUs in the cloud in somewhere between three to six months. Like, yeah. go and, I did it. Go to Dell, spec out a server. I think it's like somewhere between three hundred and sixty to three hundred and eighty thousand dollars, one up, one upfront cost for five years of support, list price. You look at the equivalent required hardware and compute capacity in any of the cloud providers. Yeah. The math is simple. Yeah. Like, yeah. if 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 that's where your data is, yeah. Yeah. if you've got petabytes you need to move out, 
the equation's going to change pretty quick. Yeah. I, I think the one, the one thing that is going to be interesting and it was brought up earlier today uh, that we actually was kind of eye-opening to me and I think to you as well was the, the power consumption aspect of that as well and how you control that. I almost think you could control the power consumption of your LLM on-premise better than you could in the cloud. So there was this fascinating presentation by IBM yeah. where and there's a, a GitHub that if people are following along, look up the session, go find the, 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 the GitHub link, follow the tutorial. What they're doing is they're augmenting the GPU's frequency, like the processing frequency, to reduce its power consumption in real time. Right. And they did a whole bunch of training simulations and serving simulations, and they actually showed <laughs> that obviously there's a response time latency difference, right? You slow the GPU down. Right. I ask a question of a large language model, might take two seconds versus you know, half a second. But they, they captured the power consumption at each of the different steps. Two seconds is not that bad. Yeah. And they basically said, yeah. what is the user's expectation here? And what was truly fascinating is the power consumption and temperature went below the idle state. Wow. There's no workload state of the GPU. That's really strong. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it was actually, I think that's uh, the, the folks from Kepler that we, the Project Kepler is what they're that's Red Hat. Back. Oh, IBM yeah. Research and yes. Intel and, and, and Red, Red Hat, Hat. Kepler. Yes. Yeah, we talked to them earlier and I, I think that you, you, you hit, you're hitting the nail on the head. I think that. That's a power awake workload scheduler auto scaling yes. feature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. pretty cool stuff. That, I, yeah. I mean, I come from an application performance monitoring <laughs> background, so yeah. I, I love nothing more than charts and widgets and things that yeah. are spinning. <laughs> I, I was just looking at it thinking, this is huge. Yeah. That's monumental for a, a public cloud provider. That's monumental for anyone that has to be in the data center business that will be running GPUs. Yeah. And yeah. if you want AI to, to help, at some point you're not renting GPT-4. Because yeah. right. that's table stakes. Yeah. You get what everyone else has. We when were you're talking about the right? FinTech side of the imp impact of FinTech uh, with AI. One of the things we were talking about same, on the same lines is, first phase was physics. Packet A to packet B, high frequency trading, right. you get that edge. Yeah. Every second, and millisecond counts, nanosecond. Now, the data edge is in time to insight. Yeah. So now, that's not physics, that's, that's querying, that's latency language models, do you have the data, you tune, like, like that's nothing to do with packet moving. Although, latency does matter when you get the answer. It, it does. But maybe they, don't, they might not get the answer. So that's an intellectual challenge. That's an algorithm challenge, the right algorithms. It, What's your reaction to that? Because that's like the two-step process. Nail the physics, latency, and then nail the query. It's the question, right? I think the, the really great data scientists out there are the, the people that can have that thought, they have that cognition before you do. Yeah. And then they start building a model on it, and then they're like, I need the data to, to, to train and validate this, cool, put it in production. Well, you're in the FinTech world, Something changes, another thing changes, you've got drift. Okay, now I need to retrain my model. Yeah, right? whoever does that fast wins. Correct, so it's that life cycle. Yes. And I think yeah. that's fascinating. Yeah. Right, I mean, yeah. I'm pretty new to this area, I'm learning as I'm going along, and to me it's, it's, it's a brilliant area to be focusing on, and it, it, I think it will help many businesses and organizations globally, but it's how, how can I best make use of this technology? How can I make it accurate, fair, how can I understand what it's doing, right? And how do I keep it up to date and yeah. accurate? Well, explain to the folks out there watching, what does Platform 9 do that gives them context? Because you guys have been in this business of doing the heavy lifting on behalf of, in Kubernetes, but this is also portable to yeah, I mean, AI. One example is, let's say you're a, you're a retail organization, you've got self-checkout. And one of your solution providers says, hey, we've got real-time machine learning that will use your video feeds of your self-checkout and alert you when there's some nefarious activity. But it requires some server hardware that's got you know, GPUs in it. And you think, oh, okay. I hear this, I think, you've now got the ability to inference in the store, let's lay it down cloud native there, let's use Kubernetes. But don't do that by yourself, Just along with the solution provider that's doing that video piece, 
get a stack that means your operation teams don't have to go and learn Kubernetes and figure out how to run every store. Remove the truck roll aspect of that, right? Manage that hardware remotely as well. So all of a sudden you've got provisioning remotely, you're laying down a cloud layer, and that hardware that might have been just doing the video inferencing, now your data scientists can give you models to run in the store right. and do other real-time inferencing to improve your customer's experience and launch new products. You need Kubernetes to do that. Running Kubernetes in 300 stores is going to get pretty complicated, yeah. right? Yeah. You want to be able to do that remotely, standard, repeatable, yeah. and if things are going wrong, you need a partner to lean on to, to and, solve that. And the trend too is to let the talent be focused on the, the activities that they need to be. Correct, get them, get them doing what they should be doing. Um, data science teams, they're, they're the teams that are just doing this, right? They're, it's not even yeah. shadow IT, it's like fully funded <laughs> new business unit spinning up stuff in a cloud or maybe doing stuff in a data center. If they're using spreadsheets to organize who can run what on which hardware and when, that's not a huge ROI, but the, the gap to get to, well, I've got a, a pipeline tool and I've got some automation, some ML ops happening, once again, they need Kubernetes. You don't want them focusing on that. Yeah, yeah. You want them focusing on asking the right questions. And they need to stand right really strong infrastructure on-prem, cloud native, getting it up. Platform 9 is doing great stuff. But get a, put a plug in for Platform 9 for the last minute we have here. What's going on with Platform 9? What, when do people call you? Um, what, what's the when solution? they realize their teams are spending too much time building Kubernetes platforms and cloud native infrastructure, when they should be helping them launch new applications and hit their business objectives. And like, getting it to AI quickly. <laughs> and get, getting it to AI quickly. Like if, if you've got GPUs sitting there and you're, you're thinking, wow, maybe my team shouldn't be manually scheduling time to run workloads, then take that step, reach out to Platform 9 and say, hey, help us do this more efficiently, consume more of that cloud native stack anywhere we want it, so our team can actually be, be more productive. Large language models, foundation models, as code. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, check out, that, check, out, check out IKEA's presentation. Yeah. Go to, the, I think it's the second or third last slide. See that stack. That one from here. The one from yeah. here, okay. the one from today. Check it out, we IKEA's presentation. Will. Chris Jones, thanks for coming on, Platform 9. Wrapping up day two, I'm John Furrier, Rob Strecce. Wall to wall coverage, this is the most important open source event in North America, Open Source Summit 2023. The Cube is on the ground. Been involved in open source from day one. Breaking down the analysis, trying to get the best, asking the right questions. What will AI do? When will security be solved? How will the community respond as it continues to grow exponentially and ecosystems are forming? A lot of dependencies that are becoming platforms. These are all amazing next-gen open source questions. We're here to help. See you tomorrow, day three. We'll be back tomorrow. Thanks for watching. <laughs>